So let me try and share my screen and hope it works. Um, when I when I did my interview for my job, I had a, a real problem sharing screens, um, and I wondered whether they would actually take me to the next uh, level. They did, which was nice. Um, so um, can you see my screen? We can indeed. Okay. So um, Pentecostal theology and public life emerging uh, trajectories. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to um, Zimo uh, for the invitation and for uh, Regents uh, as well. Thank you to Dave and all involved in this. It's a, it's a great privilege to be involved, not just um, in this particular lecture, but also the Donald G as well. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very grateful. Um, I have my own pictures. Um, uh, <laughs> pictures are important, aren't they? Let me let me start with uh, this one of William Seymour that I've given you a clue. This chap appeared in the earlier um, uh, set of pictures. Not the the best picture. Um, some of the um, the Google images don't don't come across brilliantly. Uh, why do I start with William Seymour? Um, I start with William Seymour um, because when I lived in America. Um, I attended a charismatic Anglican church um, that we loved, actually. Uh, it was a wonderful church. Um, but it had uh, a very special relationship with an inner city church that was uh, a Pentecostal church, Cleveland, Cleveland uh, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, denomination church. And most of the folk who went to that church were African-American. It was one of the poorest churches I've ever visited and, and had uh, some... Uh, relationship with. My wife was on staff there, actually. And I would go um, from time to time, and I would do things there. I'd preach and, and minister. It was uh, an amazing church. And you would meet people uh, 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 who were African American who had um, really difficult backgrounds. Uh, many of them had been uh, living on the streets. Many of them had uh, experiences of poverty and drug addiction. And uh, they used to have a men's Bible study. And occasionally I was invited to lead the Bible study. And a lot of the folk who at the Bible study um, were men who left school with very little reading ability. And they'd been converted. Uh, some of them had been delivered and healed uh, from addiction. And they were there studying the Bible and reading the Bible. And it was just an immense privilege um, and I, I think about what William Seymour did and how uh, white people attended this fundamentally black church and Bartleman's line that the color line was washed away by the blood. And my own experience of the hospitality of African-American Pentecostals is quite remarkable, really. And yet at the same time, recognizing their poverty in, in certainly in, in urban areas and the uh, injustices that they still experience are, to are still there today. When Alexander Boddy visited America, visited Azusa Street, there were two things that he was most concerned about. One was uh, in Pentecostals and generally in America, the emphasis on money. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> but the other thing was the, the segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws uh, appalled Alexander Boddy. Um, and whilst we don't have segregation in America, there's still a huge divide, and we see that obviously being played out. Um, so I, I start with William Seymour just to kind of anchor some of what I'm going to say from my own experience, and I'm very happy to talk about that uh, in, more, in, more, in more detail. So where am I going uh, today? Put my glasses on now. I want to just begin with some historical musings, if I may. Uh, this is for the historians amongst you. I'm not a historian, but I, I work with two historians, William Kay and Alan Anderson, both historians. So. You, you, you can't work with people who are historians <laughs> without picking up some history. So I've picked up some history along the way. Um, I want to talk about William Walter Hollenweger a little bit because he was a remarkable man uh, at Birmingham in the 70s and 80s. I want to note some general um, uh, recent developments in Pentecostal studies and, and public theology or public issues. Um, I want to just outline something about the nature of public theology so we have a, a kind of broader understanding of that and then share some some findings from the mega church project uh, that i was involved in and and then um in preparation for this particular lecture i thought i would 
I would revisit JEPTA, the Journal for the European Pentecostal Theological Association, because I know Simo is involved and others are involved. There are two special issues, one on social justice in 2011 and another on social and political engagement, Andrew Davis edited in 2018. And I've just kind of done a quick survey of some of those articles and picked up some points that I think can help us. And then to reflect on some explanations as to why there has been limited engagement by Pentecostals historically. Uh, and that picks up some of the things from the JEBTA articles and then look at some possible future trajectories. So <clears throat> um, this is another historical figure, Alexander Body. I'm a great fan of Alexander Body, actually. He was a, remar he was a remarkable man. Uh, but he, clearly a man of his time, Anakin, and he um, grew up in Manchester, very middle class, but he grew up amid the poverty of, of Manchester and moved to Sunderland and the industrial north and the demands of that. So he, he knew something of, of the poverty of, of industrial north of England. Um, and he was a vicar who ministered to everybody in his parish. I mean, that's what vicars did. That's what vicars do. And he was nevertheless a, someone who was searching for something more. He attended the Welsh Revival, we know that, and he managed to get Thomas Ball Barrett to come over and to uh, minister in 1907 and the first Whitsunside con convention in 1908 and the beginnings of Pentecostalism in Britain. But um, World War I had a huge impact upon early Pentecostalism and in particular of course, whether people should go to war or not. Now, Alexander Boddy and Cecil Polhill both supported the war. And in fact, uh, Alexander Boddy visited the front line and did some chaplaincy work. But many early Pentecostals uh, did not want to go to war and some actually went to prison instead as, as pacifists. There was the expectation amongst early Pentecostals that Jesus would return in 1914. Um, of course he didn't. <laughs> Just thought I'd confirm that in case some people might have thought he did. But instead, World War I occurred. This eschatological expectation was very prevalent at the time. And Mel Robert talks about people leaving the Azusa Street mission and going to wherever they went to do evangelism and uh, being called missionaries of the one-way ticket. They didn't expect to return, not because they necessarily expected to die, but they did expect Jesus to return. So evangelism was at the heart of Pentecostalism. It still is at the heart of Pentecostalism. We need, uh, we desire, we require people to come to faith in Christ. But also spirit baptism as an empowerment for that witness. But the question is, what's created by these people being rescued? Is it as an old an alternative city, an alternative polis, uh, a, a sacred uh, space that's separate from the world? Or is it about a renewal movement? And Pentecostalism has struggled with these ideas. And Alexander Body didn't want to start uh, a new church. He was committed to the Church of England. Um, early Pentecostals didn't follow him in that. Um, but other subsequent re renewal movements have. So, interesting origins, interesting uh, public issues and how they had a, an impact on Pentecostalism. And already right at the beginning, you have the seeds of a struggle of what does the church do in relation to society in light of its mission? There were really odd perceptions of Pentecostals. I'd, you'd be interested to see <laughs> and hear your perceptions uh, Pentecostalism is much more uh, accepted today. Some people might even say it's fashionable to be a Pentecostal. Hollywood stars have become Pentecostals. Well, in the early days, they weren't received very well. Uh, other Christians rec regarded them as too earnest, um, too passionate. Uh, some people regarded them as too, too wacky, uh, out, of the, out of the ordinary. But what about the public areas of life? It's not clear that Pentecostals were very involved in the public domains of society. Yes, there was local charity work, work, absolutely. But what about engaging in the broader areas of politics, economics, uh, media? Well, they like the media, but they use the media for evangelism. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, when I come onto the internet later. 
Well, here's a man called Walter Hollenweger. This is a picture of Walter. Uh, I only met Walter Hollenweger once at a, at a conference at Birmingham before I worked there. And I thought he was a rather odd man, if I'm honest. <laughs> I shouldn't confess that, but I'm going to. I thought he was a bit odd. <laughs> and uh, I mean, maybe people think I'm a bit odd as well, but maybe it goes with the territory, who knows. Um, but one of the things that Walter Hollenweger did was he looked at the University of Birmingham in the 1970s and said, where are the black students? Where is the church's involvement in the life of theology and religion? And so he helped start something called, uh, called the Centre for Black and White Christian Partnership, which had uh, was a significant vehicle for dialogue between different churches. And many of the black churches were, of course, Pentecostal churches. And I remember training to go to Nigeria and went out with the Church Mission Society and was at Crowther Hall in the Salyut Colleges. And just round the corner was a Centre for Christ Black and White Christian Partnership. It was still going strong in 1991 and I think it probably fizzled out about 2004, 2005. There may be others who can correct my date on that. But this was a significant uh, move to help people uh, from certain backgrounds gain access to educational opportunity. And it came from a man who is the father of the academic study of Pentecostalism because many of his students came from the non-Western world and came to Birmingham to study with this man, principally around mission studies, because he was actually professor of mission studies, not Pentecostalism. He just attracted so many uh, Pentecostals because of his work. But he had a broader vision of just simply the academic study of Pentecostals. Uh, recent developments are really interesting in Pentecostal theology. Um, we might want to talk about this. Um, modernism and postmodernism. I don't know if we still talk about modernism and postmodernism, but the idea that Pentecostals can actually do their theology not in a kind of objectivist manner as modernist thought would have told us, but actually in a more tradition specific way, uh, more akin to the post liberal ideas of working from within your traditions and from within your church traditions in order to speak out of those traditions uh, to the world. And so there is a kind of move, which I think is very strong now within Pentecostal theology, that uh, theology is tradition specific. And this comes out of most re more recent developments. And I think that's a, a good thing, uh, not a bad thing. Um, but of course, there's always dynamics and there's always a family rivalry. And I noticed this particularly in America, where the reformed camp of evangelicalism um, still is hostile to the Wesleyan camp of Pentecostals. And you see that, and, and my Wesleyan Pentecostal friends at Regent were very critical of reformed theology and felt they had more in common with some aspects of Catholic theology than reformed theology, which is kind of interesting. I don't think that plays out in the same way in the British um, field. And you can, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, one of the things I'm learning is um, I'm learning again uh, <laughs> about British evangelicalism, having been in a university sector and then in America, I, I feel a little bit out of touch. But what, what I see and what I sense is that evangelism is still at the heart of the idea of public engagement. But it's allied to the idea of witness at work that actually whole of life discipleship has now become the new norm and LICC is at the forefront of the discourse around that. I think the question for me is what about the state? We come back to the, the nation states. How do we engage with the nation state? And I think in the past Pentecostals in Britain have simply, uh, whether they've intended to do that or, or not, they've simply left that side of things to the Church of England. I mean, after all, the Church of England has bishops in the House of Lords, let them get on with it. I mean, no one's ever asked a, a Pentecostal to become a bishop in the House of Lords, or have they? That's a quiz question. There may be someone who knows the answer to that. Joe Aldridge, maybe. Um, or maybe uh, Evangelical Alliance becomes a sort of umbrella uh, organisation that does all the politicking on behalf of Pentecostals. Well, is that right? Should that be the case? 
um, because Evangelical Alliance is, is a very mixed group of evangelical churches. What is a, a Pentecostal distinctive when it comes to engaging with issues in society? That's my question. Um, some of you may know Elaine Graham. I know Elaine. I've known Elaine for years. A uh, practical theologian, someone who um, is a British uh, theologian who has engaged in a lot of public theology. Uh, Elaine is, uh, uh, is not Pentecostal, it would be fair to say. Uh, she's a liberal Anglican theologian, uh, feminist theologian. She has some really interesting things to say. And her work touches on public theology and how can faith be used to reflect on issues in public life and to resource individuals, to resource politicians, to think about denominations and their responses, but also to help people in the world of work. And we're back to that. How do I, uh, how I, how do I go into my world of work and carry with me my beliefs and values in such a way that I can have some uh, influence on the context in, uh, uh, in which I find I spend most of my life. In her work uh, with Stephen Lowe and others, she's talked about discipleship and citizenship. And this, this is now picked up generally. That what does it mean to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ and at the same time be a responsible citizen? There's a tension here and there can be a clash of commitments. Um, and that's really what was going on right back in early Pentecostalism with the First World War and whether people should go to war or be pacifists. Uh, does citizenship mean that I go to war or rather does my discipleship mean that I don't go to war? That, that was at the heart of that particular issue. It may not have been framed in that way, but it was. And then what about the cultural issues? We live in a society that's changing its values and you see this, that, that things change. It's a very dynamic society. And we find ourselves challenged at times by some of the changes that we perhaps don't agree with. Um, at the heart of this, uh, we might say, liberal theology of public life, uh, uh, that's probably not unfair to call it that, um, is a kind of incarnational theology. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And the church is a kind of incarnational institution carrying on the mission of Jesus. Now, on the whole, Pentecostals, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, those of you who feel passionate about this, I don't think that incarnational theology has been a strength of Pentecostals. Uh, Pentecostals talk about Jesus, but think about the Spirit. Liberal theologians think about Jesus, but they don't really talk about the Spirit. At the heart of this version of public theology is, is an incarnational theology, which we perhaps need to engage with, perhaps not in terms of Logos Christology, but perhaps more in terms of spirit Christology. One of the things that comes out of this discussion, again, we go back to the post-liberal idea of the ecclesial discourse and um, engaging with society from the life of the church is that church communities can be agents of change. And I think that's a really important point. I raise it as a question, uh, but I really want to come back to that because it's an important area for Pentecostal theology as an ecclesial rooted uh, discourse. Uh, some time ago, I mentioned I did a, a study with Andrew Davis um, when I was at Birmingham on mega churches and uh, the team, uh, we had three other people working with us and we looked at five mega churches in London, two Anglican churches, three uh, Nigerian led Pentecostal churches. And across the five churches that we looked at, it became very clear to us that evangelism and social action cannot be separated. Um, you can't bracket off people's intention to share their faith with their desire to um, feed the poor. Now, we didn't find what has often been referred to as conditionality. Unless you come to Jesus, we won't feed you. That was not what was said. Thankfully, I'm very grateful that we didn't find that because that's been the allegation um, that, you know, this is a, a kind of um, 
conditional, you know, if you do this, then we will do that. That is not what we found, which was a relief. But we did find that actually public theology is not just about resourcing individuals. It's not just about denominations. It's not just about people going to work and talking about their faith at work. It's all of those things. But it's also about congregations functioning as units of agency in their communities. We, what I call MISO level units. So if you think about the micro and the, and the macro in the middle, middle level unit is, is this unit of agency. And that there is a kind of praxis, a way of being for those churches that can have enormous impact. And the most uh, successful uh, church was Holy Trinity Brompton through its multiple congregations and its networks. Um, huge influence um, in, in terms of uh, addressing issues and, and changing attitudes. Um, and then the, the final point was, we, we discovered that many of the mega churches don't really work together. I mean, they're too big, they don't need anybody else. But actually, we felt it was really important that more and more churches begin to establish networks uh, whereby uh, common cause can be addressed. And we even suggested that it might actually, in some cases, be appropriate to work with other religious traditions to do that, although that might be controversial. Just to kind of outline the, um, the domains of public theology, uh, Sebastian Kim in his book on public theology, Sebastian Kim is a, uh, someone of an evangelical background, Korean scholar, um, has actually quite a bit of knowledge of Pentecostalism, married to Kirsten Kim, um, who's done a lot of work on Pentecostals and pneumatology. They both work at Fuller Seminary now, but um, before that, um, Sebastian was in York and is the editor of the International Journal of Public Theology. In his book, he talks about um, six areas of public life, or what I call domains, the state, politics, policy, government, civil service, uh, security and welfare, the market, economic policy, banks, business, trade unions, globalization, etc., civil society, NGOs, special interest groups, advocacy and campaigning groups, local communities, the academy, universities, colleges, schools, research and knowledge transfer and research impact, religious communities, institutions, congregations, spiritual and ethical frameworks, and the media, broadcasting, publications, cultural artifacts and, and the internet. This lecture transcends at least three of those domains of public life. I'm using the internet, aren't we all? And we're all fed up of Zoom, <laughs> but here we are. No one ever heard of Zoom about two years ago, but here we are. Religious communities are hugely important. And the academy, we are in a college. And we're talking about all, some of these other things as well, but those that already in what we do, we already intersect with the public. Uh, Christians are already embedded in public life, and yet there are forces that would seek to squeeze us out and call us into a private existence. And I think that's something that we are resisting and we need to continue to resist. Um, and this is going to make everybody smile because this is the cover of uh, Abta, or Jebta rather. When I looked at some of these articles, and there were some really good articles, actually, so congratulations if you, you published in the article in the, the special editions I, I've been reading. I really enjoyed uh, some of those pieces. But some of the things that came through um, historically, um, the fear of radical theology. Uh, there is a fear of the impact of radical theology or liberal theology. And uh, historically, the fear of the social gospel. We can't engage in this stuff because we might lose the plot, we might lose our identity. And so pietism can lead to a withdrawal from this kind of engagement. But also um, a recognition in the articles that global Pentecostalism has and is engaging in this work and theologians are reflecting on it much more substantially so uh, Don Millers and, and uh, Yamamori's book on global Pentecostalism, they coined the phrase progressive Pentecostals uh, because of their social engagement practices. That is now uh, part of the landscape 
Um, but it's interesting, it's mostly in the non-Western world. Um, where we do talk about biblical texts as giving some theological basis for the kind of engagement, often Luke chapter 4, uh, I, I refer to that as the Lucan mandate, how Jesus is anointed to preach good news to the poor um, and the enslaved and the sick, and how that's taken on on the day of Pentecost, that the anointed Messiah transfers that anointing to the church, so the church becomes the anointed community to continue it in uh, the message and the works of Jesus. There's a continuity in terms of pneumatology between the anointing on Jesus and the anointing on the church. And at the heart of that, I think, is a, is a therapeutic soteriology that what we address in the Pentecostal theology, uh, theological world, is sin sickness. It's not just about the forgiveness of sins, it's the healing of the person. That healing is central and ask any Pentecostal and what is their favorite text? And they'll say, Isaiah 53, by his stripes, we are healed. But lo and behold, the two ideas of discipleship and citizenship emerge yet again. And um, not always citing Elaine Graham and her work, but these are the themes that are now being used within Pentecostal theology, which is, I think, important. In my own work, I want to just caveat those ideas slightly. A couple of Journal of Pentecostal Theology items I, I published some years ago and I'm still working on. The idea of critical companionship, that just as the Spirit walks alongside the disciples, so the church in the power of the Spirit can walk alongside the world uh, as a kind of critical friend, um, engaging, um, but also accompanying. I think that for me was an important insight from those paraclete sayings in John's gospel. And then the gifts of the spirit from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says the gifts are given to each member for the whole body for the sake of the common good. And I argue in an article that there's a spillover effect. The church is for the world and the gifts are for the church and through the church for the world so that the, the, the spirit gifted people can take their gifts into uh, the world. And I talk about the gifts of healing as part of that. And that links back to the therapeutic soteriology. And that links into the idea of political pneumatology that actually polit politics is, it, it can be perceived as narrow when in fact we can have a much more expansive view of getting involved in the body politic. And that pneumatology can empower us as Christians and as the church. And David Muir finally talks about spiritual warfare. Um, it doesn't take Pentecostals very long to talk about spiritual warfare, the principalities and the powers. And of course, you can't engage with the world without engaging with the principalities and powers, however we understand that, and we can talk about that if you want to. So some explanations as to why Pentecostals have withdrawn, and I pick up some of the things already mentioned. Um, an ecclesiology that uh, accentuates difference over and against the other. Uh, mission and evangelism as a kind of rescue mission rather than a transformation of society. Cultural reasons. Pentecostalism often has its own distinct subculture and often is on the margins of other ecclesial life, especially in, in, in contexts where there is a, a dominant state church. And I, and I understand this as a Church of England person, that a lot of my Pentecostal friends um, feel somewhat out of, uh, on the edge or out of the conversation. David Hilborn some time ago uh, started some Anglican Pentecostal conversations. I was party to a couple of those, and I picked that up from those conversations that many of the Pentecostals felt that they were uh, perceived to be uh, inferior even uh, compared to the Church of England colleagues. And then social reasons. I mean, Pentecostalism in Britain has been rooted in the working class um, and often social class is ignored. And I think it's a really important dimension of, of Pentecostalism. Um, Pentecostalism has often been for the poor with the poor and I don't know if we've lost that in the social mobility. I mean, social mobility is a good thing, but whether we've lost that is a question to be asked. 
And then educational in inequalities. Um, and we come back to Hollenberger's point again. Um, and I think Pentecostals have come a long way since the 1970s and 1980s. But how far do we need to go? And then uh, a couple of more slides, and then I'm, I'm, I'm well, two or three more slides, then I'm done. Um, future trajectories, where do we go from here? Well, we, we need to analyze our context. This is something that practical theologians do. All theology is contextual. We can't jump out of our skin. We can't jump out of our context. We are where we are at this point in time and amid the people that we live amongst. Uh, and Christianity in, in Britain is a minority sport. Uh, we have to say that now. What will the 2021 census tell us? I don't know, but I, my guess is it will tell us that less than 4% of the population are active as worshippers in local churches. And of that, it, well, if it asked the question, which it didn't, um, if, but if it did ask the question, which denomination are you, um, we might discover that probably less than 2% are evangelical or Pentecostal. But the churches that are growing are migrant-led churches, African-led churches on the whole. We are truly in a post-Christian society. So any public engagement needs to take account of that fact. We can't assume that our voice is the strongest voice or, or the loudest voice. Now, perhaps you might say, well, Pentecostals in Britain have never assumed that. And that may well be true. Response, responses, uh, my next to last slide. What are, what are the responses? Well, I, Pentecostalism has always been a distinct movement. It's always had its own um, way of being. It's always had its own style. And that I think will continue. There will be increased social mobility through education. People will, um, educational systems will develop people more and more people will get PhDs but we need to think more systemically not just individually and locally how do Pentecostals engage with the bigger systemic questions that I think is is a question and then the church communities we have the translation question uh, it's not just speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues it's speaking the language of Zion, interpreting the language of Zion. How do we take the language you use and translate it? Can we do that? Are there some things we simply can't translate that are irreducible? Um, I've argued that Pentecostals focus on new mythologically driven praxis. And if that's the case, it's a praxis that should lead to greater engagement, not withdrawal. And to accompany that, I do think we need to develop a more incarnational approach to complement the new mythological approach. I also think that we can't escape identity politics. Identity politics are here to stay. So do we need uh, coalitions of support? If so, which coalitions? Uh, what are the politics? What are the ecclesial politics that we cannot escape? And what about the post-Brexit Britain? and global Pentecostalism. Um, Pentecostals are everywhere and they're coming to Britain and Britain is leaving Europe or at least leaving the EU. And we have to find ways of managing those social dynamics as well. And so discipleship and citizenship are not narrowly British, but they are global. And I think British Pentecostalism uh, like all forms of Christianity in Britain, needs to think through what does it mean uh, to be both disciples of Jesus and citizens, not just of the UK, but in a global sense as well. Some final thoughts, and then I'm finished. The precise future is unknown, despite <laughs> what some people might tell you. We do not know when Jesus is coming back. We, we do know he will come back. This is our hope. This is our es eschatological hope. He will return. <clears throat> Look busy, Jesus is coming soon. The creation will be renewed. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. 
And I believe that therapeutic soteriology lies at the heart of Pentecostalism. The healing of the nations, the healing of creation, the healing of the world, the kingdom of God. But in this now and not yet, in this waiting, in this in-between time, we should have humility because we now live in a, in a post-colonial context. But in that context, Pentecostalism is global. And that's exciting because it means there are resources from all over the world to help, help us in our common vision and our common task. So once again, thank you so much to Simo. I hope that wasn't too long for you. I'm not sure what time I've taken, but hopefully it's not too long. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was um, perfect, perfect timing. No, it's just, just right. And thank you for just mapping out really the, the Pentecostal um, public theological field and practice um, for us. Really, really appreciate that. Now we'll have um, 15 minutes or so of, uh, of questions. So really it's over to, to you as, as participants. Um, <clears throat> less people are thinking, Mark, I've got a question um, for you really about this um, incarnational approach to, to public theology. You talked about the Pentecostal pneumatological aspect and you would want to see that more coupled with the incarnational approach. Could you maybe just spell that out a bit more or, or define or develop what exactly do you have in mind uh, when it comes to incarnational public theology? Mm. Yeah, so I haven't thought about this too much. I've sort of thrown it out really. It came to me today uh, as I was uh, skimming through Elaine's book again. Uh, I think it's about um, taking seriously the material conditions of life really and the and the human dimensions of life the word becoming flesh and i think that's really at the at the, at the heart of it um rather than the kind of more rescue orientation it's about you know um christ uh in indwelt uh if you like uh humanity and there's a kind of indwelling a habitation that I think uh, we need to think a bit more intentionally about. Um, we tend to think of spirit Christology and the spirit coming upon Jesus and Jesus going off and doing the anointed ministry. Whereas the Johannine Logos Christology is, is a different kind of approach. And I, and I, and we, you know, I've done what a lot of people do is we rush to the paraclete sayings, <laughs> John, <laughs> right? Um, but we don't spend a lot of time in the prologue and ask the question, what does the prologue mean for Pentecostal theology? And I think for me, it's about reflecting on the prologue. Um, now, there are some people, I mean, historically would say, you know, the church is an extension of the incarnation. There are some questions around what that works, but how that works and what that really means. I've said that the anointing on Jesus is extended to the church. So I'm, I'm using the same logic. Um, so I think there's something that we need to explore uh, uh, in, in that way. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, thank you. Well, we've got some questions coming in now. Um, Jean Daniel, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you very much, Mark, for uh, your excellent presentation. I have enjoyed listening to you very much. And I have especially, I would like to follow up on, on Simo's uh, remark, uh, on incarnational theology, I think this is really something uh, that we Pentecostals have to think about. And I'm very glad you raised this, Mark. Um, but being a Pentecostal, couldn't we also go a step further and include an incarnational pneumatology, uh, saying that Jesus became a human being and lived among us and God, because God loved the world so much. And after the resurrection, God loved the world so much that he sent his spirit among us. And uh, God is taking risks because he's poured out the spirit on all flesh and in, in and the spirit is alive in the church. 
because God wants to use us through this, his spirit. So the, there's a few questions uh, that the, I was wondering how you would respond to this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's a variety of ways of, of, um, of coming at this, actually. And um, so whether you come at it through um, incarnation, life, ministry, uh, whether you come at it through the cross, whether you come at it through resurrection, ascension, I think the life ministry of Jesus, but the pouring out of the spirit upon all flesh, absolutely. Uh, there are some parallels there. But again, um, we're mo we've moved away from logos to pneumatology. Um, and I think the question is, how do we, how do we um, combine a logos Christology with a, uh, with a spirit Christology? And um, so those are the kind of questions, but absolutely, I think they're complementary. And I think that the old uh, view that you would push them apart and choose one over the other, I think that was a wrong headed move. We need both Logos Christology and Spirit Christology because they're both in scripture. Um, and the church, yeah, absolutely, is united to the head by the spirit. Um, so the phrase uh, totus Christus, the total Christ. And so, um we the church is the body of christ united to the head by the spirit so absolutely so i i think i think we also need to move um into a trinitarian framework as well i think uh, pentecost really for me only makes sense because of the doctrine of the trinity because jesus receives the spirit again from the father acts 233 then pours the same spirit out upon the church the church is constituted by the spirit so I think there's a number of implications here. Once you start playing with, <laughs> this is theology for you, once you start moving in one direction, <laughs> you start then touching on a whole bunch of other doctrines, and that's the beauty and the fun of theology, that you, you have this kind of intersection of different theological loci that you have to begin to move together with. And if you get out of kilter in one area, it will affect other, other areas of your theology so absolutely i think we need to hold a lot of things together in harmony and in balance so yeah i i, I agree thanks jean daniel thank you mark i think we have a question from uh, margaret's ipad or maybe julian ward so um yes i'm not margaret um i enjoyed your lecture very much indeed thank and you. Uh, your survey of you know, practical theology insofar it concerns Pentecostals, I'd be interested to know whether you're able to uh, tell us uh, whether there, are, there is serious in-depth thinking going on among some Pentecostals on issues like poverty in Britain and the domain of austerity, which is undoubtedly going to continue quite severely with the amount of expenditure on the coronavirus crisis, or people engaging in ethical issues like abortion or whatever, um, trying to think out in depth, not only what the ethical issues are, but what we should be doing about it, and uh, whether any Pentecostals are seriously engaging in the global, global warming issues, which are going to result in probably the biggest challenge to the future of the human race for centuries, maybe since the Black Death. <clears throat> Some small issues there, Julian. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it was, uh, poverty in Britain. Uh, yeah, no, 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 I, I've got, no, thank you very much. Uh, brilliant. Um, so I'm not aware of um, people addressing poverty from a Pentecostal perspective in Britain. I have to say there may be some people who've done that. I did have a PhD uh, student in America called Brandon Kurtzen, who looked at uh, poverty and urban America from a Pentecostal perspective. He was a Foursquare pastor. And so he used his own Foursquare tradition, which obviously has some resonances with Elam. And um, he wrote a book, um, well, his PhD became a book that was published a year or two ago where he was trying to articulate a Pentecostal theology uh, in relation to, to poverty in America. I'm not aware of anybody 
who's done something similar in the UK. Um, in terms of ethics, there's been quite a lot of work done on social ethics. Um, so Murray Dempster's done work, uh, American again, and some Hispanic uh, Pentecostals have done some work around uh, social ethics, uh, obviously allied to a kind of Hispanic Pentecostal liberation approach. Um, so I'm aware of some, some work that's been done, um, and I'm also aware of some virtue ethics uh, that has, has have been written, but I'm not aware of, um, I'm not aware of the kinds of things that you're looking at in terms of the kind of nutty, uh, the, the, the knotty, sorry, the knotty ethical dilemmas that we face. I'm still waiting for something to, to, to address those, those, those areas. And, but there may be other people here who can answer that question who are in touch with some things I'm not familiar with. Um, in terms of global warming, absolutely. Uh, Eco-theology, so again, I had another PhD called A.J. Svoboda. Um, he was a student, he uh, wrote his, his a PhD called Tongues and Trees, and it was an attempt to uh, construct a, 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 a kind of pneumatological eco-theology, uh, again, from a four-square background. I always have these four-square people. I'm not sure why I have these four-square people, but anyway, they mm -hmm. seem to turn up and want to do things with me. Um, and AJ has written some other books on eco-theology, and um, that is now developing, actually, from a Pentecostal perspective. There are some really interesting pieces emerging. Um, so there are gaps, and there are some uh, signs of, of, of development and growth, but there's still a lot, a lot to do, especially from a British perspective, I would say. But others might be able to uh, shed more light than I, I can on, on, on the British uh, field. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good. So I'll read a few comments, um, some questions from the chat. And actually, Malcolm has just made a point that uh, Mareka has done interesting work around poverty and justice. Mareka Hork, who's actually here on the... Oh, OK, the great. So, um, that's, that's probably worth, worth looking into. Um, a few questions here. Mike Reed asks, being surprised by negative responses to being a Pentecostal minister by ministers in the USA, an assumption of being associated with health and wealth theology, how different are Pentecostals in the US compared to the UK? So I guess that comes to um, the early, some of the earlier things you reflected on, Mark, in the interview. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends where you are. I mean, the, the US is very diverse. I mean, you know, you go to, um, you go to Oregon and you're going to have a different reaction than if you go to Texas. I mean, you know, America is hugely, hugely diverse. So it depends who you talk to, what kind of action, reaction you, you get. I mean, working at a Christian university that has been associated with, <laughs> shall we say, right-wing republicanism, I, you know, I've walked into academic conferences and had some very rude comments <laughs> because my name has had this kind of uh, tag from my university because of perceptions. And actually, I had a conversation with an academic at one conference, and she came out with a, a whole bunch of stuff that was clearly wrong. And I began to kind of explain to her actually why uh, her um, perceptions were wrong. And she was kind of offended that I was trying to correct her perceptions because there's something deeply ingrained uh, in, in the perception of the other. And any, any gentle correction can be, can be met with some kind of resistance because again, you go back into this kind of polarized world. So I'm not surprised uh, the health and wealth um, and TV evangelists and all of that are very popular in America, uh, perhaps more so than the UK. So I think that would be a that would be a big difference. I mean, my ex my uh, experience of Pentecostals in the UK is that the health and wealth gospel is nowhere near as popular uh, as it is in America. Of course, it's hugely popular in Brazil. <laughs> Just go to Brazil and it's it's massive uh, there, especially with churches like the. Um, Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, um, about which I've just written an article, but that's for another time. Yeah, Thank I hope that you. helps. Got another one from um, James Seeger. Um, so thinking about the fact that we're a minority that needs to change society politics, what do you think we can learn from other social minority movements that have had an out of proportion impact on social and political change? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think persistence 
really. I mean, I, I, the great role role model uh, for me is the the Clapham sect. Not really, they weren't really a sect. They were a group of people that lived in community and were strengthened in their Christian life in the 19th century. And William uh, Wilberforce, um, 18th, 19th century, William Wilberforce had a huge impact. Um, and I, I was telling my class this morning, you know, read, read the biography of William Wilberforce. Uh, he had a huge impact uh, on, on British society. And um, he put forward uh, every year for 20 years a private member's motion bill in the House of Commons to abolish slavery. He did it every single year for 20 years. Um, that tells me it's about persistence. Uh, choosing what to fight and what not to fight. I think we all, we can't fight everything, but doesn't mean to say we can't fight some things. And I think what is, the, what is you know, what, what are the things that are, are dearest to your heart? What are the things that are central to the gospel? Uh, my daughter is passionate for anti-human trafficking um, and, you know, modern day slavery is huge, actually, um, huge, global, the second largest earner in terms of global business uh, now behind the arms trade. That's quite a startling fact. So I think uh, persistence is key, knowing what you want to do and, and not giving up. Good. Thank you, Mark. So lots of questions. Let's go um, briefly to um, John Asher, then Maldwin, and then Malcolm Duncan as well. So John Asher, if you want to ask her the next question. Ah, oh, thank you, Simo. Mark, thank you so much. That was absolutely gripping. Um, you, you let, let me just preface this by saying I, I saw a fascinating YouTube debate, Cambridge Union debate, between Giles Fraser, a vicar, and Stephen Fry um, about disestablishment of the Church of England. And Giles Fraser was arguing for disestablishment, and Stephen Fry perniciously um, uh, was arguing against it. And so I wondered, just in light of some of your comments, uh, about uh, the established church and, and how it can make the rest of us feel sometimes. I just wonder how you feel about this establishment. Yeah, so uh, Colin Buchanan was the bishop, the evangelical bishop in the 80s and 90s that argued for disestablishment. And uh, he, he argued on his own reading of scripture that we shouldn't be established. Um, and he was never really kind of followed. Um, it's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard when you're in a privileged position to give up power. And I think that the Church of England is in such a privileged position that it simply doesn't want to give up power. Now the question is, should it give up power? What's the, what are the benefits? Uh, is it strategic to give up power? And um, there are certain benefits that the Church of England is able to um, enjoy, but also use on behalf of others for their common good. So if we turn the question into a common good question, it strikes me that there are certain, uh, certain common good aspects uh, for the status quo to remain as it, as it, it, it is. Um, I am sympathetic um, to disestablishment I studied Jürgen Moltmann when I was a student at LST in the early 80s and the church and the power of the spirit and the phrase that unholy alliance between church and state. And yet I am a Church of England minister and I have I have sworn um, uh, to support the Queen as part of my ordination, uh, post ordination vow. Um, and so I'm a supporter of the monarchy. Um, but does that mean establishment of the church? Well, I think there's a debate to be had. Why would Stephen Fry support it? Um, he might support it for uh, sociological reasons. I'd be interested to listen to that debate. Why would Giles Fraser uh, want it disestablished? I think because of the power issue. I mean, he's a kind of liberal, liberationist type folk, a person who wants to disinvest structural power because he feels it has corrupted 
the nature of the church. That's my guess. And I think that uh, going forward, I, I'm one of those people, I want to see it play out. I'm not going to advocate for one way or the other. I want to see it play out. But I would not be surprised if in 50 years it is disestablished. And I think that it will happen, if it does happen in the next 50 years, it will happen when Charles becomes king. That's my prophecy, but don't stone me if I'm wrong. Thank you, Mark. Time is against that, but let's, as I promised, let's go for the two final questions. Uh, Maldon, if you could be brief, and then uh, Malcolm as well. And sorry for all of those who've asked really good questions on the chat, but I'm afraid time is running out. Maldon, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I just want to make a quick observation and then a question. My observation is your remark um, concerning body and evangelism being at the heart of early, um, of early British Pentecostalism. George Jeffrey certainly did not take that view. He felt that early British Pentecostalism was wrapped up in itself and concentrated more on conventions and meetings of um, believers than it did on overt evangelism. But my question is, do you detect that British Pentecostals are following their uh, American counterparts in embracing right-wing political views? Um. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We could have a historical debate about body and Jeffries. Um, that would be fun. Uh, let me pass on that one for the moment, if that's all right. <laughs> um, uh, I, think, um, I think I'm not qualified to answer that question. I've been back in the country a year and I'm still learning the, I'm still learning what the political temperature is. And I don't know. Um, I think there might be some sympathy but when I speak to my Pentecostal friends in the UK, they're not huge supporters of Donald Trump. Whereas in America, wow, goodness me, Donald Trump is uh, hugely supported by um, Pentecostals because of the ideological bundling I mentioned, right? Yeah. He has put conservative judges into the Supreme Court. He is fighting a pro-life agenda. All the things that they want, he's doing for them. You know, the wall, anti-immigration, uh, you know, the marketization stuff. I mean, all of that. He is playing exactly as they want him to play. And that's why he has huge support amongst a certain conservative right-wing Republican constituency, many of whom are evangelical and Pentecostal. I just don't see that being played out in the same way in Britain, um, really. Uh, but I've only been back a year, so it could be that <laughs> I'm missing something. And if I am, please tell me. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Mark. And to our final question, Malcolm. Thank you so much, uh, Simo. And uh, thank you, Mark. I've really enjoyed listening to you. Elaine Graham is actually my supervisor. Um, I'm exploring um, the role of the local pastor, Pentecostal pastor in public theology mm -hmm. and what that means in a European context. Um, I, I have a couple of questions that are all wrapped up in the same idea really. Um, I wonder if you might just make a comment on the journey from Pentecostal pietism to the journey uh, to toward public Pentecostal theology and whether or not the four square gospel gives us a good paradigm for that, not as a replacement, but as a, an in, as an inherent continuation of Christ as healer, saviour, baptizer, and coming king, notwithstanding the weaknesses of the four square paradigm, which is something I guess we don't want to necessarily talk about today. But is it possible to, to see that uh, 21st century Pentecostalism can, with, with great confidence, step into a public space understanding the direction of the spirit, the pneumatological direction of the spirit to be one toward public engagement, which was begun in the early Pentecostal movement and continues as we seek to be the Logos, exactly as you've suggested. Could that be the bridge between Logos and pneumatology? And linked to that, 
I wonder if you might comment on whether or not um, one of the key, two of the key biblical ideas that might help us with that is firstly the idea of a, the, the ecclesia pre-Paul and how that can be interpreted as a spirit community charged by God with the responsibility for the well-being of wider society and the community in which it finds itself, which Paul redeems as an idea. Does that work? And lastly, within the same context, um, is there something about public Pentecostalism, public theology Pentecostalism in the 21st century that might be helped by reflecting on where the spirit was at the crucifixion and Pentecostals identifying with suffering and developing a public theology that gives articulation to some of the pain, to use Maltman's ideas, of God forsakenness and God aloneness. And might that be a helpful journey for us as we articulate public Pentecostal theology in the 21st century? Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks very much, um, Malcolm. Uh, great questions. Um, Certainly two of my Foursquare students did use the Foursquare Gospel as a way of focusing the theological lenses. So I think um, within a kind of post-liberal pa paradigm, using the tradition and speaking out of the tradition into uh, the context, that's a very helpful thing to do. And I see that as continuing uh, as a way of coordinating a theological reflection. So I think that is very useful. Um, interestingly, that Amos Young, in his book on political public, Pentecostal political theology, The Days of Caesar, um, used the fivefold gospel he threw in the Wesleyan dimension of sanctification, even though he's not a Wesleyan himself. <laughs> and I think in, in, in a review article on his work, I, I, Amos is a friend of mine, but I, I accused him of flying under a flag of convenience to do that because it really wasn't his kind of heartland fivefold gospel thing um and interestingly he's just become a, a, a uh been accredited with the, the four square uh, into uh, pentecostal domination he's actually assemblies of god but he's got dual uh, um dual uh, credentials now so yeah i do think there's something about that and that i agree would link back to a logos gospel orientation so i do think that's very fruitful and I would encourage Pentecostals to coordinate that. Um, I know that uh, Wolfgang in Birmingham has also done some work on the full gospel around that. I mean, uh, I'm very appreciative of Wolfgang's work. Um, my critique is that, uh, my critique is if we simply say that is the Pentecostal identity, that all Pentecostal theology has to be channeled through mm. the fourfold or the fivefold gospel, that's in my view that's wrong and i had a disagreement with don dayton about that who sees it everywhere and i said it isn't everywhere you know i had i had an indian pentecostal student who constructed an ordinary pentecostal christology so a christology from below that did not relate to the fourfold tradition or the fivefold tradition uh, because in india it just doesn't have the same currency so i think we have to be careful that we don't impose a paradigm on others uh where it doesn't work in the same way but 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 certainly i think it has mileage absolutely um i think there is something about the acts 2 community that you mentioned uh at the end of acts 2 and that community and what they're doing and sharing um resources um kind of early socialism that my capitalist friends don't like but it seems to be in the text um and i think there's something about that that's important so i, I agree with that um, I'm not sure I would bring uh, have a sharp division between a a pre-Pauline ecclesiology and so Acts, Luke, Luke and Acts. I think we can we need to kind of work on those together in a complementary way. I think, um, and then the final one about suffering. I think that's absolutely right. Um, whether we want to go the whole hog that Maltman does, I'm not sure. I mean, his crucified God has some some interesting uh, aspects to it, um, but. The idea of God forsakenness is an interesting question and abandonment, abandonment. and uh, in the next lecture, so this is the teaser for the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the dialectic between presence and absence in terms of online virtual mediation. And I think there is something about the cross where God is deeply present but also absent. There's a kind of paradox there. 
and what's the spirit doing in in that and i think once again the answer is it's a trinitarian event that helps us get a handle on that and in the crucified god maltman really wasn't proposing a kind of trinitarian account if anything it was more of a binitarian account and then later on as he moves into his social trinitarian uh thinking he, he, he develops that but i do think there's something about pentecostal developing a theology of suffering um they are they have we have focused on this therapeutic soteriology which i think is right but alongside that there needs to be a theology that engages with things that don't quite fit whether that's to do with people not getting healed or whether it's to do with disability or whatever i think that has to come alongside it ab absolutely thank you Good. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Mark, for your answers and for taking time to respond to all uh, so thoroughly.